take Norris Gut. Okay. So before I jump into that, let me just say that uh, as an artist, you need to really get yourself out there and promote in a huge way, much, much more than anyone possibly can imagine. I remember 10 years ago, I was meeting with a woman who had a framing gallery and I wanted to have a show there. And so we set it up and I had a show there and I thought, hey, I finally made it, you know. So that was just the very, very beginning. You know, you have to do lots of shows and you have to have lots of exposure and get seen wherever you can, you know. And now I'm posting once a week at least with uh, a new piece of artwork or an older piece that someone hasn't seen before. You know, on Facebook, I'm doing it on Pinterest, I'm doing it on my blog, you know, mentioning my website and, uh, you know, everywhere I can think of on social media. So we did some research on social media with Rose's help and uh, kind of narrowed in on what what I think I should be doing and where I should be, you know, and the, and the blog is a very important place because uh, it's a permanent record on Facebook, things kind of vaporize, you know, after a period of time and, you know, they're still there but it's hard to be seen. But if you have a blog and you uh, do some search engine optimization on it, you can rise up in the rankings um, a lot easier um, than you can on a, on a website. It seems that the search engines put more of an emphasis on blogs than they do on web, you know, normal websites. And if you use the keywords and you search engine optimize it, you can, you know, get much higher in the ranking. So I'm working on increasing mine for abstract art, et cetera, et cetera. But the point I'm making is you need to get out. And one way to get out is to, uh, you know, start entering some of these competitions. And I've done a lot of outdoor festivals, but I haven't really done some of these other avenues, you know. And, and so I got a chance to look at this website last night and I got very excited about it. And I said, oh wow, there's an opportunity. Oh, there's a grant. They're giving out $50,000 to several artists and all I have to do is submit some slides and they'll pick several artists and you get the money and you don't have to do anything for it. They just give it to you and you can do whatever you want with it. I want $50,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what there website are is hmm? <laughs> what website is this? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. This is my intro to get your interest up. <laughs> so I guess it worked. Yes. Okay, so uh, this is what Christopher shared with us, and I just looked at last night. It's called CAFE, which stands for Call for Entry.org. That's the uh, URL. www.call, C A L L F O R E N T R Y.org. Um, I don't know. No, I mean in the room. Oh, is so anybody currently on this? Yeah. Oh, you guys are? Oh, great. Maybe you should be up there. <laughs> so, um, the first thing you do is, uh, you know, you open this up and you uh, register. <coughs> it's a lot like uh, this application, if you're familiar with that. Some of us art festival people are very familiar with that. And, uh, it's kind of a similar thing where you, uh, you first register and then you upload some portfolio images. And then, um, and it's just like this application where they need to be 1,920 pixels across, you know, by whatever the other dimension is. Um, and you upload them with a description and, and that sort of thing. We'll, we'll take a look at that. And then you can go through and view some of these calls for, for artwork and events and things and apply for them. And some of them have an entry fee of like $20, $40 or something like that. And some of them don't. So we'll, we'll get started here. I'm already logged in as uh, Scott here. Um, but here's the uh, the profile, what the profile looks like. No, that's not it. Hit it twice. So, um... It locked you out. Oh, it did, didn't it? So here's the profile, just like the other sites, you know, with the username and password and your uh, contact information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then I uploaded um, just the three images just to get started. You hit this upload media button here, and you um, and they have a, a fact page that tells you, you know, what the size of the images need to be and that sort of thing. And here's my sunset triptych, which I'm well known for. And you have to put in the medium, the dimensions, the price, year completed, the primary discipline, digital media, etc., etc., and a and a description. 
So um, you can add uh, quite a few. They give you a lot of space to to put your profile, your portfolio in there. So then you can go to uh, apply to calls. And right now I don't have anything in entered here. It says all for fees. There's no limit to the fees and sort by name. And then it just gives me a, a listing here of like everything that's available. However, I could sort, you know, for just Florida if I want to do something like that. So if we put in Florida, then we just get the Florida ones. And let's see, here's something in Miami Beach. Well, this is a residential program for artists. Is there anybody in the room who's never used a program like this before? So here's one that I had heard about, but um, I hadn't seen the official call. This is the Tampa Bay Lightning fourth annual call for entry. And it says the, uh, the arena and the Tampa Bay Lightning are excited to announce our fourth annual open call to artists exhibition. We invite Lightning fans and members of the local arts community to submit pieces of original artwork to be hung for display in the arena during the 2015-2016 season. We're looking for pieces that exude the energy and feel of surrounding community, visually celebrating Tampa Bay and its people through art. Most mediums accepted. Submission due September 9th. Scott, I was in that one year. Yeah. And um, it's really cool because they videotape all of the artists who are in it. Mm -hmm. And they ask you a bunch of questions. And um, then during one of the games, they actually, during a break, they play the videos for the audience. So you're wow. up there on the big screen on uh -huh. your mission. Nice. Yeah, it's really That's done great. very, very nicely. So I saw this last night and I go, I have a hockey piece. I created a, a hockey player. I should submit that. Absolutely. And Lorraine, aren't those on, they're on display for like a year? Yes, for I think it was a year. Yeah, And they have a reception. Mm -hmm. uh, I was out of town for the reception, but I heard that it was absolutely wonderful. We framed for a couple of people who have won awards. I'm convinced that if you get a frame here, you win an award. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is the secret. Yeah, yeah. 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 So if you're a Blackhawks fan, you might be blackballed from Alabama? Just I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't ask, don't tell or something. <laughs> what a huge season. lightning fan. <coughs> now here's the uh, Tampa International Airport. Lorraine just went to the meeting last week. A couple of people here did. Yeah, Candy and I did. I don't know if anybody else did. So that sounds exciting, but you have to have sold a piece for $15,000 yes. or yes. something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. either sold or have been commissioned for a piece that's a, at least $15,000. But yeah. that's only just that one call. Just, just right. for that call. Right. That call sure. is for the new uh, okay. renovations, the new buildings. There, the there's so thing. much art that's going now into the Tampa International Airport, and they do right. have other artists called currently and upcoming where they don't have that kind of a rigorous. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the thing is that each one of these has its own specificities, and so when you write your information, you want to write to what they're seeking. So, yeah, that was my next point. You need to sort through these and see which ones are applicable and which ones you qualify for. So those are the upcoming ones um, in Florida at the moment. Um, we can reset this and look at a few more or move on. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited about this. I hadn't seen this before. I'm trying to get more exposure. Here's some out in California, Los Angeles, Luna Beach. Oh, and that one for grants. You had some interest in that, right? Mm -hmm. Call type. Grants. Or maybe I shouldn't tell anybody about this. <laughs> <laughs> so grants. The Santo Foundation Individual Artist Awards 2015. Three artists will be selected to each receive $5,000. Five additional awards of $1,000 each will also be awarded. You can click here to view some more information about this. And the deadline is 10 31 15, 73 days remaining. So um, I think that's it. says funds are to be used at the artist's discretion with no follow up material required. That's strange. 
<laughs> well, you might want to check out the Matrix for real. Yeah. <laughs> they do have a $40 entry fee. Right. Now, I, I wanted to, because there's so many people here who are not familiar with a site like this, um, our, one of our favorites is called Art Opportunities Monthly. Yeah, and when we used to, to subscribe get. to that, it was a whopping $65 a year, the best yeah. $65 you'll ever spend. And you'd get a PDF and you could search it based on words. Um, we would always search a buying gallery as opposed to a showing gallery because that's a difference. Pay attention if you're out of town, you want to show big so you can sell big, but you got to pay to ship big. So mm -hmm. you have to think about things like that. Art opportunities, um, what? Art opportunities monthly. Monthly.com. Yeah. The okay. reason why we're talking about cafe tonight is because this is what the local city governments use. This is um, what the local city governments, the nonprofits, and that kind of stuff use. As opposed to what Scott had referenced earlier, if you want to do outside shows and things, application, that kind of stuff. With Art Opportunities Monthly, they have residences, they have grants, um, they have shows. So, uh, and generally, you can get a free one month, free so that you can check it out. So let's look at your pictures that you uploaded and see how you named them. In. Another one called Thoughts of Blue, <coughs> which is hanging right around the corner there. So how many pictures do they recommend that you upload to this portfolio? Well, you can upload quite a few. It gives you, um, I forgot what it was, hundreds and hundreds of megabytes. Yeah. I mean, you can upload as many as you could possibly want to. Some of the calls I noticed would call for one to eight images. Oh, okay. So, okay. And then for those specific calls, do you attach which images you want sent with it? Or is that yeah. how it works? Or do they just have a link to your full portfolio and they're going to go look at it? I mean, like yeah. that one for the hockey, are you able to specifically say, look at this picture? Or are they just going to maybe see it when they look at your portfolio? Yeah, I assume it's like this application where you can pick which ones that you want. Okay. There's like a little, I don't know if I can remember, there's like a little box that you X. Okay. And so those are the images that you can send to them. Okay. So this is like a storage facility, an online storage facility of all of your work. Okay. Yeah, here's one I started to fill out and I saved it ready for submission. And here's a review of it. And I had just submitted this one piece, but I could have selected others. The entry to this is thirty-five dollars. Um, I've got my artist statement there, so you have to have that too. <coughs> but yeah, I could have picked uh, a number of them. I don't know what the limit is, but some of the entries had, you know, were up to eight images to, to show. So yeah, you can reorder images. You know, re put them in a different order. Okay. And then there's the checkout, and that's where you. Uh, Pay, it's thirty-five dollars, etc., etc. Christopher will probably have an opinion, but does anybody want to voice in an opinion on making sure that all of your pieces look like they belong together from the same artist? You know, sometimes over a period of time, you've got some images that are straight on, some are three D, some have a black border, some have no border, some have wallpaper. So it's. Um, yeah, lately what I've seen, and maybe you can substantiate that, is that they pretty much want to see the image. They don't want to see the frame or anything else. You know, they don't. They don't want a, a quarter on look. You know, they just want just the image, nineteen twenty pixels on the long side and whatever the other side is. When when I've filled out any of these, I stay with like I do realistic pastels, but I do abstract mm -hmm. and I'm going to do one or the other depending on what I think is going to work. I'll either do all of my um, pastels that are realistic mm -hmm. or I'll enter all of my abstracts, but I don't mix them. And I want it to all look like it's coming from the same artist, so. Um, but you have yeah. all of those stored on this site, right? <coughs> you only submit, right? You, you only, only submit, submit the, the ones, no. Styles, right? I don't, I don't. I think that that's confusing. Yeah. Um, so, but there are certain places that I know my abstracts are going to work better in certain places, I think my okay. pastel realistic ones will work better, but I don't mix the two of them applying the same. Yeah, and that's a very good point. My very first art festival, I don't know, 10 years ago, 
I had a little bit of everything. I had my abstract, I had photography, I had a portrait in there, and it's, people come by and say, well, how many artists are represented in this <laughs> booth? You know, yes. they go, oh, geez. You know, it's confusing enough at an art festival where they're seeing you know, up to 300 tents, you know, and looking at all the images, and here I have a little bit of everything, photography, abstracts, and whatnot. So that's a real good point. Um, whenever you um, submit for something or have a show, you should have a body of work, <coughs> not just everything you can produce and showing off all your capabilities. You want to have a, a theme, and with my um, abstracts, I picked the theme of having uh, real colorful abstracts that, you know, I've done this 3D program, it has a certain look to it. Um, it has transparency, it has a glowing thing to it, you know, and usually I have like a, a spotlight behind it, you know, creating like a, a sunburst of some sort or a glowiness. So that's my theme that I adapted to uh, have a, a body of, or several bodies of work that kind of hang together as, as a collection so that they know that I have a definitive style. Because, um, you know, I was a professional photographer for many years, I did graphic design, you know, and I'm in the art field. I can do almost anything, you know, pretty pretty well, convincingly, but it's hard to market yourself when you're all over the map. Most people don't know how to think of you, or they won't remember you. Or so, yeah, create bodies of work, and you can create a, one body of work and move on to another body of work, but you should probably have at least, like, like these, I did 12 of them, so that I had a, a body of work. And I'm gonna expand it, but that's a body of work, which is different from the other stuff that I do. And I can have a sell sheet on that, I could have a website on that. Um, I can give them to a, a sales rep and they have something to work with and they have enough variety that they can uh, reach a lot of different people with the different uh, subject matters. But it's the same style and they know it's from the same artist. Now, I wanted to ask um, the people who know who use Cafe, I'm assuming it's like this application where you get uh, notifications when things, certain things come up. Is there a way that you, you get auto because I was a little surprised when Scott did the search through um, Florida. I did, it didn't seem like there was a lot. No, there aren't. But a lot of the, the emails, there are very few that are in Florida. They're all over the country. Okay. And out of the country. I mean, you, you can get them like from Mexico and other places. Okay. Now we have some other links that uh, were provided to us. And I have some of those here. <coughs> and this is Broward.org referring to Broward County, which is around uh, Fort, the Fort Lauderdale area. Um, and so here are Broward calls to artists, the Dwayne Hanson Elliott Artist Program, pre-qualified roster. We can email these to you if you want. This is a group of uh, current uh, call to artists that Christopher sent. Oh, by the way, he felt so bad about being late. He's offered to give everybody his business card, and he's going to help review all your stuff. <laughs> Does he know that? <coughs> no, he said that. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'd love an email on, on all of it. I would love to get yeah. an email on all yes. of it. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I, so that was part of the reason for grabbing everybody's. I know how you promise things from me to other people, and sometimes I don't know about it, so I don't know if that applies to others <laughs> as well. <laughs> so that's one. Here's another one. Division of Cultural Affairs. I've done this one before. Have you really? Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and once you do it, you're on their mailing list, and you get, mm -hmm. right now, I'm, I'm getting two and three, like a week. Wow. And what is it? Well, this first call is the University of Florida Chemistry slash Chemical Biology Building. And um, if you dig into it, they give you, there's a PDF that shows um, the building, you know, and the different locations where they need artwork. Um, it did look like you had to come up with uh, kind of like a plan on different pieces, different places. It looked like a lot of work to uh, apply for it. but. Uh, the budget's $95,000, so it might be worth a little bit of time if you think you have a shot at it. <laughs> I, I've had one piece someplace, I think it was Manatee County, that was actually purchased for one piece. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that, was, that was pretty cool, but this is, I think this is a good site. 
Yeah, using my 3D graphics, I could do molecules and all kinds of interesting things in the field of chemistry. And mm -hmm. So they have the budget that they purchase the work? Is that what yes. the budget's for? for mm -hmm. the work and normally what they're doing is they're, they might be expanding and mm -hmm. putting some more buildings up and all of that, and they need artwork. <coughs> so um, it's pretty cool. So you're going to email us this list of links mm -hmm. that you have? Yeah. Oh, okay. Happy to do that. This is that specific one with the chemistry building. They give you lots and lots of information. There's a whole lot going on here. They yeah, do there, a lot there's of a lot of stuff you have to read, but it's <laughs> worth it. So there's the building, and then there's a, um, a site plan. Here it is, showing the places where they need north entry landscape, the north entry portico, atrium, blah, blah, blah. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces for $95,000. I could probably work that out. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't really have to designate my piece to go here, here, or there. They're just showing you the what, various many? places, and they give you dimensions, so you know if you have a really large piece, that yeah. they can accommodate that. Some of them will accept 3D work and 2D work. Some of them need outdoor stuff, so it's pretty wide open. But there's a lot to read through, but it's worth it. Are they choosing? A bunch of different artists for each area, or, or one. just one? One person that's going to get all 95 I don't yeah. know. Yeah. So generally, they, they pick different. Different. No, they pick different okay. artists. Yeah. yeah. Well, you can read this at your own leisure. <laughs> I'm tempted to read the whole thing now because it's exciting, but Let's move on we'll move on to the next one. Perform. This is the Arts Council, Hillsborough County. That's another good one. Mm -hmm. Sculptors, folk artists, Coconut Grove Arts Festival. I've done that about four or five times. Melbourne Art Festival, Temple Terrace. All right. <clears throat> the ability and the willingness to read things like schematics and drawings is really very useful. Uh, we do a lot of work for Starbucks and we get the CAD drawings and we have to create pieces based on teeny tiny little CAD drawings. We had a situation last year which was kind of embarrassing where we were ready to ship something and at the 11th hour, the last minute, we realized we had created the piece two feet too large for the wall. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Because we didn't read the wall correctly. And that would have sucked <laughs> if it had exactly. gotten to California mm -hmm. and they said, gee, it doesn't fit on the wall. Why they invented the sawzalls? <laughs> My thoughts exactly. <laughs> yeah. What did you do? I mean, you had you the last minute thing. It. How did you redo it so quickly? We just made it fine. It happen. We just made it fine. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, it was a quick contract and we made it fine. Wow. It was night. Night. And we apologized. And we laughed. And then we just hung up the phone and we went to work. <laughs> um, but that kind of stuff, when, when you play in these kinds of arenas and you get all that packet of information, you need to know everybody else is looking at all those little things. You know, and so you've got to really be willing to, to do that too. Yeah, as an artist, we get excited about the art possibilities and start creating right away without reading the fine print. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do that way too much. <laughs> you get inspired. Yeah, you, you do. Right ahead. Oh and you want to move on it while you're excited <laughs> about it because you let it sit for a month and you lose the excitement. You yeah. know? Mm -hmm. so that's why it's good to uh, read the fine print or have someone with you who right. will read it over. Like <laughs> no. One of the things Brooke Allison, who can do now, maybe other people in here, uh, she's an unbelievable pastel artist for many, many years. She said that um, you could have the best artwork in the world, but if you don't satisfy the criteria, you're yeah. out. Because there are so many people right next to you, so you can have beautiful stuff, but if you didn't enter it the right size, or you didn't whatever, 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 you're it's just gone. You're gone, and they, they go on to the next person. So 
the devil's in the details on these things. Yeah, and you're about to bring up the time I judged that show. You may. <laughs> I got asked to judge an art show, and my selection for second place got declined because the artist didn't fill out the title and the size. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just a little administrative oversight or didn't bother, you know. Mm -hmm. So they had to go to somebody else. They got rejected out of hand and it was like the most incredible piece. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, you gotta pay attention to the details. So if, you, if that's not something that you enjoy and that you're good at, that's okay. You find a friend <laughs> and you buy them coffee and they be the one that reads it, things over and checks it for you. And that's fine. There's ways around that. What else is on the list? Well, this is the Arts Council in Martin County, which is out on the other coast. But uh, there's always something interesting. Barn theater auditions. I don't know. <laughs> Sarasota. That Sarasota is always good for uh, selling artwork. It's one of my favorite areas. Call the artists for Art Matters. Art Center Manatee Art Matters is an open all media jury exhibit that celebrates the importance of art in our lives and in the life of our community. Art will be displayed September 1 through October 2nd. Opening reception will be September 3rd, 5 to 7 p.m. The exhibit and reception are free and open to the public. So entry uh, is available through August 20th. So these are just more shows? Yeah. As opposed to something that you can submit for, but even still. Maybe I'll do this one. Hmm. All right, so moving on. This is down in the Keys. Third Thursday walkabout. <coughs> I'm headed down to the Keys, honey. See ya. Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville. I think if you, a lot of times too, if you pull something up and you're not familiar with it, it's not a bad idea to Google the um, promoters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just a little word of caution. Um, and and check the particularly if if your budget. I mean, it's only thirty five dollars, forty dollars. Fifty dollars typically to apply for things, but when you find yourself applying for ten over a couple month time frame, that starts to add up to some real money. And uh, we want to believe that everybody who is helping to support artists is good and honorable, but that's just not always the case. So if you're if you're not familiar with something, if it's not a mini sale or a coconut grove, it's something you've never heard of. Never heard to take two minutes aside. Do they not screen a lot of the people? A on lot these? of them don't. No. They can't. They can't. On our professional site, we have a rolling S um, of shows. And I mean, even our, our opportunity monthlies, they say we don't vouch for these people. So you some. Um, and typically, when somebody wrongs somebody, People are very fast to share their experiences and make sure that other people don't have the same experience. But I think those for arts council is probably safe. <laughs> Every city has an art in the park. That was clever the first three times I heard it. <laughs> Art in the park, it rhymes. <laughs> Orlando. If you are interested in showing your artwork at one of our galleries, please submit a resume bio along with a CD containing 10 JPEGs. Well, that's nice. This is the City Hall, Public Art Coordinator, 
collections registrar. So when they say in one of our galleries, which galleries are they talking about? I don't know yet. You have to read us. It, it looks like it's the City Hall galleries a lot of times. Um, similar to in, in Clearwater where the library has a couple of galleries, mm -hmm. a lot of City Halls have their own galleries. And what do they do, like rotate artists? Mm -hmm. Just for a month or whatever. Right. right. Yeah, I was at the Oldsmar City Hall for a couple months. So it was Sherry. And, and there's the Clearwater Main Library for months. That's coming down at, um, at the, the end, end of the month, Jess said. Yeah. I got called her twice. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> this one gives a um, whole thing about the artist selection process, which is good to read through. Another good thing if you're not familiar with, if there's a way to find out on an artist selection process who the juries are, the judges are, mm. and what they like, and their personal tastes, and you can tailor your submissions to that, is never a wrong or bad thing. Yeah, I learned that, um, actually from Pierre, <coughs> he mentioned that. He came here and gave a talk about being a judge and what people are looking for, and he said that was a, a huge advantage to if you can get the names of the, the jurors, and many times they're artists, you know, and if they're a traditional, very traditional oil painter, you know, they may not like modern digital abstracts. And that's not a given that they won't, but, you know, if you had a beautiful oil, they'd probably like it more. <laughs> So that's a good suggestion is to do a little research if you can on the jurors and see if you fit into those categories well or not. <coughs> may or may not be true. It's just something to consider. Yeah. Another interesting thing is sometimes there aren't that many people applying for these things. and You might have a very good chance at it and you may not realize it. You know, maybe only five people apply for this thing. And then if you're at the top might surprise yourself and win a lot of these competitions or awards or opportunities to show. Some of our artists 
artwork and our marketing things, you know, to say who's in the shop right now. And the contract, because I had to get a new um, contract for the artist to say that we could use their artwork in our marketing. And we had to add a very scary paragraph to it saying that we could alter their artwork. But it wasn't really with that. Mm -hmm. It was just so I could la lay over a price over the artwork and put the artist's name on it in visual text. But because that was technically altering mm -hmm. it, we had to put this big scary thing on it. And all I wanted to do was be able to put a price tag by the next to the piece. And so sometimes when you see big scary things like that, it might be just something like that so they can put a price next to your piece. And maybe this is really naive, but why couldn't you just say, we have the right to overlay text with right. your name and a price tag. Right, then. We Clear. ended up putting that in like a footnote at the bottom of it so they understand it, but the actual legal stuff that we had to get from the, the lawyer, it sounded so scary and yeah. awful. Right. But, yeah. Well, I took this belief that they could crop it, they could take right. a section yeah. of it, they could do anything, and nobody was going to do that with my work, so I didn't do yeah. that. I thought, just stay away. Yeah. Good. And Smart. a lot of times it does mean that. You know, mm -hmm. what yours was different. Well, you guys have had a lot of questions that we haven't necessarily known the answer to, so we brought in the person who knows everything <laughs> about this subject. <laughs> Not only does he know everything about the subject, he knows everybody in Florida and this side <laughs> of the Mississippi who's involved in the subject. So, um, Scott, do you really need to give up your seat? Yeah. Do you need the internet? To um, not the internet, but I'll just plug in here. Okay. And, um, got a little presentation for you. Thank you all for your patience. I apologize. This is like the other half of a public art specialist's life is kind of doing whatever pops up on the side. Uh, the city is sending a delegation to Japan in celebration of our 55th anniversary with our sister city in Miami. And uh, as of that, I am the city liaison that's going to kind of uh, cat wrangle all of the council while they're, while they're over there. And so I needed to orient them as well as the citizens as well to what to expect. So Thank you for bearing with me. Um, at the end of tonight's talk, I'm going to leave my card with you. If you have questions on your resume or you have a first draft, send it over my way. I'll take a look through it. I'll give you some comments, uh, some thoughts on how to format it for public art. Um, calls to artists will be the most effective way of getting your name to the administrators like myself who often are doing about 12,000 things at once. And uh, it helps them help you better. So, so thank you. With that introduction, I'm going to try and live up to those ginormous shoes that uh, I've been put into. Um, but uh, let me just introduce myself first. My name is Christopher Hubbard. I'm the Cultural Affairs Specialist for the City of Clearwater. I've been with the city for just a shade over nine years now. And uh, I came from the Florida Art and State Buildings Program, uh, sort of serendipitously found my way into public art. Um, I was a graduate student at the University of Florida, didn't know what my assistantship would be uh, that would cover my tuition. And um, I had experience in working in museums since I was in middle school. I did an internship with the Museum Support Center in the Smithsonian um, up in Suitland, DC. That is the attic for the Smithsonian. Uh, it's where about 80% of the collection of the museum is held at any given time. Um, so with that, they have large format um, storage facilities, about as large as a football field each with four floors. They were cordoned off into anthropology and natural history, um, biology, archaeology, and kind of bric-a-brac, if you would. Uh, and in there, they had everything from a coelacanth to a blue whale to Geronimo's shield to full suits of samurai armor, uh, including an entire town that was purchased that was going to be flooded by the Wangshu Dam in China. They went through and just bought things from the village to preserve it. Uh, so that's the last remnants of that village, aside from the one that's underneath the water. <laughs> so um, that is kind of a winding way of how I got here um, as public art. Uh, I was discovered uh, by the former manager of cultural affairs for the city of Clearwater, Margot Walbolt, who you may have known and worked with in the past. Uh, she's since retired a few years ago from the city, but she's still doing consulting with nonprofit groups here in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, Margot mentored me, showed me kind of the ropes and how to work in the city climate. Um, previously, I was the uh, liaison for the Art and State Buildings Program, working with the State Department on Public Art Commissioning. Had to learn a new uh, gearbox on how to work in a city management because things are far more uh, close as far as people 
people's politics and what goes on with commissions. In the state system, we're so far from Tallahassee that we would do our own commissioning process. We would send in what they call dependencies, which were just art information up to Tallahassee. A couple weeks later, you get a letter back saying everything's good to go. So that was about our interaction with the state. Here, it's much closer. Got a little bit of presentation. Mm -hmm. Kind of give you the nuts and bolts on public art. Um, I'm currently the president of the Florida Association of Public Art Professionals. It is the largest, longest run regional group of public art artists and <laughs> administrators in the United States. Um, it's existed since the mid 90s and was started by a group of arts administrators that said, hey, we're all doing what we do kind of in a vacuum. We're not talking to each other. We're not following a best practices format on how to both help the administrator and the artist make the most out of the project. Um, one of the biggest uh, sticking points in public artwork is who do you pick, where are they from, and why did you pick them? And um, to dispel kind of a lot of that, we often just look at the piece of art. And these are the, the good administrators that know you're looking for the piece of art that's the best fit for that facility. It's not about the name, it's not about the notoriety, it's not about the price, mm -hmm. unless you have a kind of stopping point. Um, but you're looking for something that's going to work harmoniously with that building. And that's the best form of integrated public artwork. And that's kind of the top tier of what we strive for in our program. So let me get this going here. And um, I can do questions in the middle. Um, like I said, I apologize for my lateness. If I was any later, they would name me Gugo. Basically, here's the nuts and bolts of uh, players' protocols and programs. How to get from the idea past the panel to a finished product. If anybody's here in Clearwater, uh, when it's working, this is the uh, Fire Station 48 installation off of Belcher. Uh, it was designed by an artist, Christopher Fennell, who's based out of Birmingham, Alabama. Um, he was born here in Pinellas County, still has ties to the area. Um, those ladders that you see in that picture are all decommissioned fire ladders from Pinellas County and City of Clearwater fire stations. Uh, every so often they have to pass an inspection and if they don't, they get cut because you do not want a firefighter going up to save you and have a wrong break. So what Mr. Fennell did was take all of those, re-weld them back together, bend them into that flame installation. Um, a lot of times people will ask, well, how do you know if a project's successful or not? And uh, this is a really good one in which um, you know a project is successful when a firefighter has a tattoo of your artwork on their leg. So um, that was kind of a really uh, smile-inducing moment for us when the artist was there doing some touch-ups and the firefighter's like, hey, come here, I want to show you something. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, um, and that's what we strive here in Clearwater is to have a diverse body of work. We're a new program. We only started in 2005 and really took effect in 2006. So we've only had a handful of commissions. But that doesn't mean that we're not working hard on doing something good for the city. It's just going to take a little while to get there because our funding process is tied into the city capital projects. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Now, this is how we go from bottom to top or top to bottom. Now in Clearwater, the Municipal City Council is elected by our citizens. And they're kind of the end all be all to public art decisions. All of our contracts are approved and reviewed by City Council after going through the lawyer farm, after going through my desk, after going through the artist desk. So there's a number of different layers in there. However, rest assured that the contract that we work on here in Clearwater, and we're trying to push out to other cities as well, is approved by the Americans for the Arts Advocacy Organization. And what they did was they put together a panel of artists and administrators throughout the country, and advocates as well, and found the fairest, most accurate contract for a public art commission that you can get on the market these days. Um, this applies to the Visual Artists' Rights Act of 1991. Um, this also applies, uh, applies to uh, defacing an artwork, uh, what to do, what happens with that, how do you handle it, um, the artist has first right of refusal, so it, it covers all those bases as well as maintenance agreements, contracts, rights of reproduction, um, and the title of the works. So it's an all-encompassing agreement that can be cut up and trimmed down to what's necessary. I have worked hard with our city attorneys to get it into a fashion that the city of Clearwater has bought into it. 
Um, and this is the boilerplate that I use for all of our documents. So your rights as artists are protected. We will not knowingly deface a piece. We will not decommission a piece without talking to you first or your heir should you pass on. And we have had an instance with that. Um, in fact, we did deaccession a piece but still have it. So it has never been disposed of. It's just been taken out of sight. So if you have a question, we'll get back to that. But um, the city council has appointed our public art design board. And Jerry is on our board right now. She's a representative of the artist community. And that board is made out of artists, architects, um, administrators, and folks that are in the know about what public art is, including a representative from our Clearwater Arts Alliance, which is our local arts advocacy agency. And they review all of the proposed commissions for public art to ensure that it does one of three, well, actually, all of three things. One, it's in an area that's accessible to the public during normal business hours, 9 to 5, when somebody can reasonably expect to come into a facility and see a piece of work. The other is that we expended the appropriate amount of money. The city has an obligation to put 1% of capital improvement projects that are not restricted funding sources. What I mean by that is sometimes there are a grant that is restrictive in what you can put money into, um, whether that be from a state or from a governmental agency. Sometimes it's a restrictive site, say for example, a water treatment plant, uh, which under new Homeland Security, um, all uh, water and uh, utility maintenance has to be out of the public. You can go see them with an appointment, but it makes it harder to see a piece of public art if you have to call in advance before you want to see it. And the third is that we work with a professional artist. Now, for groups of artists, this is the most interesting to you. A professional artist is defined as somebody who receives either a majority of their income through the creation and sale of artwork, has an extensive exhibition or creation portfolio, whether you've been exhibiting or creating works for a number of years, or you have received training in the arts from an accredited institution. Um, that covers undergraduate studies, that covers graduate studies, even if it's not in the medium in which you're currently working, you have had some training in the arts and you understand what it is to be an artist. Those are our three basic things. And they're easy to hit, but we also have to make sure that those are all well documented. If a citizen ever asks to see those, we have all that information at the ready. So the Public Art Board serves as our, as our oversight committee as it, and is endowed by the City Council to manage the Public Art Program. Then, for each Public Art Project, a selection panel is created. And these are the folks that get together. There's usually a representative from the facility. Say, for example, we're going to do a new library installation. There's a representative from the library. There's a representative from the community that uses that facility. It's the friends of the library or somebody that lives near the site or somebody that uses it a lot. Um, and then there is a representative from the public art design board. Yes, I that right. It's been a long day. Um, <laughs> Uh, representative from the public art board to ensure that our processes are followed. Mm -hmm. There's also a citizen representative that's often a community member. There's the building representative that is who designed or is from the city that worked the most on that project. And there's someone from Parks and Rec on there, usually that's me, that serves as the li liaison. I don't vote, I just operate the machine. Mm -hmm. And there's always an artist on the committee as well. So we've got a well-rounded group of people that are looking into the best possible piece for the best possible fit for that facility. Go one more step down, you've got me. I'm the administrator. I don't ever make any decisions when it comes to artwork, but I do my best to provide the selection panel with as much information as possible so that they can make their decision the best. I get the artist's background, what pieces they've done elsewhere, projects that are on the same budget, projects that are higher or lower, um, the artist's diverse portfolio to show them different media that they're um, commanding enough to be able to work in different forms if they're applying for a project that's outside of their usual ability. So, I operate within the panel, and the panelists get together and they say, okay, so we're going to build a new library. Um, it's a community library. It's used by mainly this neighborhood here. I'll, I'll give you a, a recent example of the Countryside Library. They're adding an expansion on the Countryside Library. They're taking it from its previous site, which is next to the fire station on 580 and Countryside. And they're moving it over near the Countryside Recreation Center on Sable Springs. But we've already gone through the public art process for this one. But what happened was we sat down together with first the library users and the architect for the facility. And we said, 
where are we going to put a piece of public artwork that's going to have the biggest public impact? Now, a library is usually a big facility. The public can go all over the place inside of it. So where are we going to get the biggest attention? The entrance. Fortunately, this library had a <coughs> vestibule that had two entryways and was also a hallway that connected to the community rooms and the restrooms. So we've got our site. But it had a pretty low ceiling, so we couldn't really suspend anything from there. So we looked at the floor. We said, all right, well, what do we currently have on the books for the floor of this library? Stained concrete. It works. It's modern. It's not all that aesthetic. We said, what if we did terrazzo? And what if we worked our piece of public artwork into the terrazzo? We started working through the budget, and we saw that we could start pulling from the concrete budget and supplementing the artwork budget using existing dollars. We didn't have to expand on the facility costs to put a higher grade of artwork in there. So we said, let's put together a call to artists that says we're looking for artwork that is in the, the main entry vestibule, that is either terrazzo or tile or some form of embellishment to the floor surface, and that our budget was just shy of $50,000, which was for the commission of the piece and the artist. This was a, a strange one because they had gotten so far along in the process that they were kind of running to catch up at the end. So what we said to the artist was, when you get this commission, we're going to pay you $10,000 flat out. We're going to give you the money for the design of this piece, and we're going to poke at you until we find something that we like. But then you don't have to worry about any of the site management. We will take care of the rest of that. This is counter to a usual public art commission because the artist often serves as the on-site person saying to the contractors, this goes there, I need you to tie into here. They work with the architects to do the pinpoint installation, for example, at a suspended sculpture. The artist has to work with an engineer to figure out how it ties in the ceiling to make sure that that's correct. If you're doing an in-place installation, say a ground-based sculpture, how is it anchored properly? Um, you know, is it put into an area that's outside of the normal public flow that nobody's going to crash into it unwittingly? Um, can it be seen if it's on a corner and the entrance is over there? Can somebody look in at night and see it lit up? Is the, is the lobby lit up at night? Those are all the questions that an artist needs to come at when they're advertising for a piece, but also when they're working with the administrator like myself. I will ask you those questions as an artist of, have you thought about how to light this? Have you thought about this uh, material that you're using? It starts to degrade over time. What's your maintenance plan? How do you plan to account for salinity exposure if it's outside next to the salt air? <coughs> or how do you account for um, what they call live loads, which is somebody that climbs up on it? Um, if a person is meant to interact with the piece or is not meant to interact with the piece, how do you account for that? Um, and how do you go, where do you go from there? So those are all the things that, when you get a call to artists, what you need to start working your gears on is, is this the right fit for me, or am I just applying to it to apply to? Now, there are other ways that you can show up on the radar of the public art program without necessarily, necessarily applying to every call to artists that you see that comes out from that. And we'll get to that. So, when a panel gets together and they put a call to artists together, what are they looking for in an artist? Number one, experience. And that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. But no, most notably, does this artist have the metal to come forward to this public art installation and know what they're doing? Have they done a piece like this in the past? Have they worked in a facility like this in the past? Have they interned or mentored under somebody that's an established artist? Those are the kind of things that we're looking at to say, yeah, we can trust in this artist that if something comes up, they're going to know what to do. Nothing comes up, honky dory, everything's great. You know, any artist that can work in that medium might not have a problem. But if something goes wrong, are you going to have the wherewithal to figure out how to work with the administrator to get it back on its tracks? Knowledge of the material. Have you worked with this material your entire artistic career, or is this a departure for you? And what's your level of confidence with that material? Do you know how it interacts with the environment? Do you know how to maintain it or fix it if it breaks? Because public art is a living piece of uh, artwork. 
it's what we call a museum without walls a lot of times. It's in the public space and people interact with it on a daily basis. Um, who's been in Clearwater for a long time? Show hands. Jerry? Anyone? Do you remember the lizard sculptures behind the library? Okay. They were, um, uh, an artist, Paul Eckling, is locus, local to the area, would take recycled materials, car bumpers, um, pieces of engines, any kind of scrap metal they could find, and turn them into creatures. And so behind the library, we had these two lizard men that were in an area, uh, like a waterfall area, landscaping. They'd been there since the early 80s, um, which was part of the um, artist in residence program that the city did. It was a precursor to the public art program. And since these sculptures had a, well, let's say a finite lifespan because they were recycled metal to begin with, um, they deteriorated over the years. And unfortunately, we didn't have a maintenance plan back then for keeping track of them. So flash forward about 25 years in the future, I got a call one morning from one of our trades workers and he says that he's got a lizard's head in his truck. <laughs> well, why are you calling me? <laughs> um, and he says, no, no, it's the metal lizard from behind the library. Somebody had decapitated the lizard, and um, so I went over, picked up the, the head, uh, went back out to the site and did a condition report on the existing piece. It had been out there for so long that there were a lot of punctures as far as weathering. Metal had rusted through. My intern that was with me cut her finger on the head, and I said to myself, well, this is obviously something dangerous to the public. Um, there wasn't a maintenance plan in place. We need to take it out. That's the piece I referenced before. We still have it in storage. Um, I've contacted Mr. Epling's estate. He was in poor health previously. I don't know if he's passed on or not, but we haven't gotten a response. Until I get a response, we will store that because though we removed it from the site without previous artist's permission, we cannot dispose of it without the artist's permission. Um, we removed it for public safety uh, because it did present a hazard to the community. Um, however, destroying it, we can't destroy it because it might present a hazard. So it might still be of meaningful value to the artist or the estate. Anyways, that falls under knowledge and material. Know the medium that you're working with because things like that will come up. And you may get a call from an administrator one day saying, I have your lizard's head in my hands right now and I need to know how you're going to go about fixing it. We'll of course pay you for that because unless that's written in your contract that you maintain it forever, forever and ever, amen. Um, you're probably not going to have to bear that responsibility. <laughs> a good program will build 10% of its budget into maintenance for the longevity of the piece. Longevity is also one of those flexible world words in the field of public artwork. Some pieces may last in perpetuity, and in fact there's a lot of artwork that's out there from ages before we could write that still exists. A lot of modern pieces don't have that same timetable because we're using modern compounds, alloys, um, coatings and things of that nature that deteriorate over time. So know what you're working with or know somebody that does that you can call up. You don't have to be a pro in every medium that you work in, but you should definitely know a conservator or somebody that knows what they're doing and how to take care of it. Participation in exhibition. That you've gone out into the world, that you've shown in places large and small. Um, you know, eight small places are just as good as one large place when it comes down to the experience of it. How did you set up the space? How was it received? Um, you know, what was the space? What was their mission? Um, how many people did you reach? Those are all important to a public art community because if your artwork doesn't attract people and if it doesn't engage in a conversation with the viewer, then it might as well just not be on public display if it doesn't engage the folks that we're trying to do. Um, that's always a sign of a successful project is, I know people will say, bad press is good as any press and it's kind of similar though not entirely equatable in the art world in the sense that case in point we had a, a sculpture downtown um, at the beginning of our temporary public art program and it was called Sorcerer's Gate. If you've been here longer than seven years you may have heard of it. The sculpture is pretty innocuous. It was a big purple gate, 12 foot tall. Um, but the name Sorcerer's Gate did not mesh well with some of the religious community here. They had a good point. To their own religion, the idea of a sorcerer was offensive. And so we took that and we said, okay, totally understand what you mean. Just wanted to let you know that the money that we spent on this 
was not from city funds. It was actually a donation account that we started out that developers donated into to public art in the community. We took that money and we put it into a sculpture program that started and is now entering its seventh year. Um, we wanted to let them know that we didn't spend city money on it because that's a big sticking point for folks that feel that city expenditures need to be somewhat straight and narrow, middle of the road, not kind of offend anybody. Anyways, once you get down to the end of the discussion, they said, okay, I still don't like it, but I accept that it's there. And so it was there for the rest of the year, no other incidents. And one of the council members remarked to me on kind of like the last month that it was up, she said, I've seen a lot of people, little kids, playing around it and going through it, and they haven't come out with horns or tails. So I think we're doing okay. Um, so as far as exhibition, being able to weather that storm, the artist got a lot of nasty emails from people saying that, I don't like what you're doing. And the artist said, that's okay. It, you don't have to like what I'm doing, just accept that it's artwork and it may mean something different to everybody. So be prepared for that. You may get some controversy that comes completely out of left field. Because what we were looking at was, well, it's purple. Does that conform with sign guidelines downtown? We had no knowledge of what the name of the piece would be. Later on down the years, um, we started looking more and more at the pieces, and uh, the pieces names and seeing, you know, kind of doing a test of, do you have any offense to that? Does this work for you? And that's kind of what the council's there at the top of the, the tier for. That when it gets to their level, before they approve a piece, they'll look at me in the last, is this Sorcerer's Gate? Or are we gonna be okay with this? And they just wanna see so that they can be prepared to respond to a citizen's question. And that's my responsibility. Moving on to training and education. Do you have a degree? Or have you taken classes in a local arts organization? Um, have you participated with the university? Just some sort of formalized training, either a mentorship or an internship, that shows you have experience in the arts. Familiarity with the community. This can go a long way in a call to artists because they'll ask, how well do you know the community? If it's in your backyard, you can probably tell them the names of the people that use that library. But if you're applying to something in Kansas, you may need to do some research and go to Google before you start out on that call to artists. What's important to that community? Who is this person that they're trying to commemorate with a piece of artwork? Do they have a history against purple sculptures named after sorcerers? Um, those kind of things will help you endear yourself to the call to artists panel because they're, in the end, you want them to remember you for having the time to care about their work enough to put in the footwork. Um, knowledge of the space. Is it going to be tucked away somewhere that it's hard to see? You might not want to apply for it because while you might get the commission, it may be taken down in the future or it just might not ever be seen. So go for the pieces that are accessible. Lobbies are good, external is great as long as you know how to maintain against the elements. Um, one of the things that we're seeing really popular now is LED components into installations. LEDs are rather affordable these days and artists are integrating them into their pieces to give it another viewing point at night. Um, the piece changes. Uh, if you, well, when it gets working, if you've been down to the boat slips, there's a piece called Middens that we just worked with a, an artist out of Venice, California. And it will, um, once I demelt the control panel, um, will change all different colors throughout the evening um, from sundown to sun up. And it's got a full shift LED that does every color you can possibly think of. We can program it for holidays, so Independence Day it'll be red, white, and blue. Um, and so think about that into how to make your work have a life beyond its physical life just right there in place. Nothing wrong with a piece that speaks one language, but multilingual pieces are very successful in the field of commissioning art because a commissioning agency can say, hey look, it's a completely different piece at night. Um, and diversity in your portfolio. If you work in different media, if you understand a lot of different things, put that in your portfolio. Make sure your pieces that are the kind that they're looking for are front-loaded into those um, early pictures, If you know, so they, they get a first glance and they can see that you know the medium. But if you've got other things that can somehow relate to it, put those in there if there's space. Um, did Jerry and Scott talk to you about CAFE, the call for entry program? Okay. Um, 
our administrators will put anywhere between three on the load side to 12 on a higher side as far as submittals for calls to artists. Uh, these are images that you can give to them for their review. We always try to do six in Clearwater. Um, and we tell artists straight up, one, two, and three, give us your strongest, closest pieces. Four, five, and six, if you've got some diversity, show it to us. Um, so that we know you can work with a variety of different things. If you're just strong in that one thing, just show us your strongest pieces. Um, this one on the bottom is very important, and it's something I always want to express to the locals. Unless the call to artist is specifically local artist, your zip code can only be used in a tiebreaker. Now, we're going for, again, the best piece of art for that facility. If we've got a tiebreaker between a local and someone from Manhattan, we're going to go with the local because they're easier to work with, they're easier to move with, but when it comes down to it, we kind of put the blinders on as far as, you know, is this piece local but it's not quite a good fit, or is this from out of town and it is the better fit? That's what we're looking for. So, this one here changes things. Um, and in fact, there's an update to this that doesn't apply in Clearwater anymore, but some private, some public art programs have a private development component. It tells the developer of a project that if you spend X amount of dollars on this project, or over, that you're going to need to do public artwork on your site. The amount that they commission it is varies based on the city. When Clearwater's mandatory program was in place, we mandated that they spend 1% up to $200,000 for any project over five million. Now, 1% of $5 million, $50,000, when you're building uh, you know, a $5 million project, you're probably gonna put $50,000 of embellishments into the building anyways. So we can work with artists to get you those kind of things. And that was always the standpoint. But there was a Supreme Court case that decided that uh, if a community is going to put a requirement like that onto a developer, they've got to give them some tangible benefit back. Case in point, if a developer is building on land and the city says, well, you've got to improve the stormwater runoff for that site, there's a tangible benefit in the sense that when it rains, they're not in a swamp. Art is a little bit more of a gray area, and we pushed hard on the city attorney to say there is a tangible benefit, is that this building will be unique compared to everything else. But the Supreme Court said, it's your court. Our city attorney did not want to stand up and defend that. So we are now a voluntary program. Doesn't mean that developers have headed for the hills, or we are still working with developers. But there are other sites that, are, or other cities rather, that are still doing this mandatory thing. Getting back to the point of this slide, is that developers may come up against ordinances and do their own thing. They can either go on a shopping trip and just say, hey, we like your work, we want to give you money for it. Or they can hire an outside consultant, which is kind of a freelance administrator like myself. Or they go to the city or municipality and say, hey, you know your community the best. Who works in the area that knows what they're doing in artwork and would be a good fit for our facility? This and the next slide is how you get into the public art program without applying to a call to arts. Write an administrator and ask them, do you have a percent for art uh, program in which you have an artist database? Or do you have a private development program that is in need of an artist resource guide? If they say yes, ask them what format, what format do they need it in and get your butt down to the copy store and get them your portfolio as quickly as possible. Because when a developer comes to an administrator like myself and says, we need some help, who do you have locally that works in pastels? I go to my database, I search it for anybody that has pastel colors, and I ship it over to the developer and I say, these are folks that are here in Clearwater or in the Tampa Bay area that work in pastels that would be good for your facility. And then they start calling them based on who they like. So it's kind of like a curated Google search for them, that they're already vetted, the artists would qualify for the public art program, and they're sent right over to the developer. 
Other times we'll work a call to artists with them and we'll go through that same commissioning process that the city goes through. But a lot of times they want to get in, get their artwork and get out because they're trying to turn a project over. So that's important. Do a search and the organization that I'm part of, Florida Association of Public Art Administrators, it's our website is www.florida, all spelled out, publicart.org. On that site, and it's always been a bear to keep it updated, but there are over 30 public art programs that are listed on that site. Give them a call, ask them if they have an artist database or if they have a, a collection resource that they give out to developers or that they keep for their own uses for public, for public art projects and ask them how do you get on that list if they have one. That is one of the easiest ways of getting seen by an administrator. The other is temporary art. So I mentioned the Sculpture 360 program. The big chicken and the egg debate in public art is, okay, so we want to commission an artist with experience, but experience in public art commissions, but if nobody has experience in public art commissions, how do they get experience to get that job? And it kind of goes in a continuous loop. Temporary public art projects are the best way to go because they're often one-off commissions that you get an exhibition working with a municipal administration in a public space with almost no contract as far as it's a loan agreement. There's none of the crazy stuff in there as you know, it gets into a, like a 30 page contract with lawyers. It's pretty basic. You're agreeing to loan a piece for a year. The cities give you X amount of dollars. In Clearwater, we give you $3,000 for a piece for a year and a half now. We used to do it for a year, but um, we're just going to extend it for a year and a half because it's a lot to keep rotating them out. And after seven years, I don't know if I can lift up another piece of sculpture by myself. But, um, some facilities will offer you $500 or $1,000. There's competitions for uh, best of show sometimes that you can get more money. There's a ton of them around Florida. Sculpture Key West, um, there's a program in Miami. There's one in Boynton Beach called the Season of Sculpture, Sculpture 360 here in Clearwater. Um, there's Lake Wales and Lakeland, which is the Florida Outdoor Arts Foundation. So do a Google search for Temporary Public Art Florida, and you'll see those start popping up. They have either rolling deadlines, or they have um, kind of end-based deadlines. Clearwater is done for this year, but we'll put out, uh, we finish in March 2017, so January of 2017, we'll put out our next call to artists. Um, and check and see what's going on with those. They're good because they're temporary, they're good because people are excited about them, of what's coming up next in that program, and they're a good way to break in with a lot of um, good exposure at low impact as far as your first project, or if you want a project that is not going to have you hanging from the rafters trying to engineer something. Here's another slide. Um, this was what I was just talking to you about, this Florida Association of Public Art Professionals. It's now changed to administrators. And we have an annual conference every year. If you can afford it, it's the best money that you can spend to talk to the most people about public art in the state. Uh, we typically have between 20 to 40. Last year we had 50 public art artists and administrators in one location from all over the state. Next uh, May, rather, we're going to be in Venice from the 4th to the 6th. Uh, we, have, we get there for uh, the latter half of a week. <coughs> And we meet on best practices. We do a year in review and show all the pieces that have been commissioned throughout the year. Um, we also talk about what's happening in the world of public art as far as maintenance, conservation, any changes to legislature or ordinances, who's gained a program, who's lost a program. And all these folks are there to talk about specifically public art. Bring a bunch of business cards, you know, get your face out there and let them know what's going on. So that's kind of the end of the presentation side of it, and I want to jump it over to more participation side. Um, who here has submitted to a call to artist recently? Okay. Which uh, calls have you done, ladies? 
we'll start with you first. Oh, goodness. and commission uh, and the Tampa Airport has an exhibition space that they rotate fairly regularly um, and it's that question about qualifying gaining the experience or rather kind of layering the experience in a way that shows up better on their resumes um, and the airport is it's it's an odd commissioning format because they're often going for the big splash value as far as the names. Um, if, you, if you go there, they've got Christopher Fennell, and they've got large format artists that you know make $100,000 installations that a lot of our locals, it's hard to keep up with unless you've got a studio that can fabricate those things. And it's, it's sometimes it's out of reach. Um, but some of the smaller programs, like Clearwater, uh, Tarpon Springs, uh, Largo, Dunedin, trying to think of the, the ones that are active here in Pinellas. Uh, to a certain extent, St. Pete, although they're mainly going after the larger commissions these days, we're the ones that are more willing to take a chance on our locals. But I will hearken back to that previous kind of advisory. Unless it says local artists, specifically in the call to artists, we can only use your locality as a tiebreaker. Um, but as an administrator and doing my diligence to the community, I always try and get local artists into the first round if it's a piece that matches what's going on. Now, if you're an artist that works in photography and we're looking for sculpture, I can't slide you in because it's not the same medium. But if you do sculpture of any form, you're in the first round. So you do get some exposure with the selection. Scott? Are most of the calls for sculpture? Or That's you, uh, a lot of the, the calls these days are sculpture. And try, try, try as I might with the city council, every time they ask me, is this next piece going to be a sculpture? Because that seems to be the only thing I think about public artwork is. Hmm. Um, I loved that we could do the terrazzo over at the Countryside Library. There are going to be some facilities that our budget is like $12,000. And the only thing we can afford is 2D media for the wall. So painting, photography, chicle, uh, mixed media, uh, in some cases murals. Uh, we can and are allowed to and owe it to the city to have a diverse collection. So um, I can't speak exactly the same for every program, but a program that's worth participating in is going to have a diverse mm -hmm. collection. Uh, I know for the Florida Art and State Buildings program, they have all manner of media, um, sculpture, photos, uh, you know, interactive LED pieces, interactive video pieces, installations like that. Um, Though their program has had some stumblings over the last couple of years, the Florida Art and State Buildings program has an active chapter at USF Tampa. Uh, I don't know who's administrating that because it has been a rotating door for the last couple of years, um, but they are still doing capital improvement project-based commissions over at the university. And that covers all their satellite campuses as well. Um, so there may be a commission, you know, at one of the research institutes or one of their satellite campuses. We've been looking at um, the call to artists for one of those, and it appeared as though there was about five or six different locations for the $92,000 price tag. Sometimes they'll break them up, um, and they'll say, this is our splash pool of like where we want the biggest piece. And then here's, and if they're smart, they go in the list of priority. Um, sometimes they'll get down the hallways and it's kind of like just a, a photograph and that's not knocking photographs but sometimes it's not the most traveled area if they're just kind of doing some branching artwork that encompasses the facility. For all the building that we see that's going up and going to be going up in Tampa and St. Pete especially, um, you know, the high rises mm -hmm. and all the rest of that, Linux, all of this stuff, yeah. the wonderful things he's doing, how do you get in on that? How do you find out how to how do they select artwork for those types of places? 
couple different ways. Um, Tampa, their mandatory program is only in the downtown pool. Um, and that boundary shifts depending on what they want to be downtown and what they want to be in Channel Side or in the industrial district. It's a rolling target as far as like how they actually do that. I've never got my head around how they administer what the actual boundary of downtown is because you could be across the street and still be downtown, but it's not downtown. Um, anyways, there are, is an there are two administrators in Tampa. Um, the lead administrator is Robin Nye, and, and the last name is N-I-G-H. Um, and the uh, secondary administrator is Melissa LeBaron. Um, L-E-B-A-R-O-N, but she just got married. It may be Dizon, D-I-Z-O-N now. Um, they're in charge of the Percent for Art program in city and uh, mandatory private buildings. As far as the other side of things, there are two local, um, the word just escaping. two local people that work in public art, and I can't remember the uh, contract uh, workers. No, it's not right. Um, contractors? Freelance. Two local freelance administrators. Um, one is Mark Flickinger. His website is Environmental Design Collaborations. He's a former Pinellas County Cultural Affairs employee, uh, did the public art commissions for them. Um, so he does contract work for, we just work with him on Baycare, the new Baycare facility that's on Drew Street. And uh, private developer can, private developer can hire them out and serve as their public art administrator if they don't want to do that. Second is Ken Rollins and Noah Rollins. Uh, Ken is a former director of a number of museums in the area, uh, most and notably... The Rollins Gallery? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tampa Museum of Art. And he does some of the higher-end installations, uh, the large skyscraper towers. Um, and he... Uh, RollinsFineArt.com, I think, is their website. So he'll serve as your gallery representative. Now what usually happens with that is you don't pay them directly. They get a percentage of the commission um, from the developer. Um, Jerry, do you have any calls that are up on here? Or Scott, anything? Yeah, we had uh, gaps open for different. I wonder if I can maybe us. read through one with you. and Yeah, you can just pull that whole thing up. And if you go to Cafe is the very first tab. So. Perfect. And we're live. We were live then I guess it might be out. Alright, let's take a look at a call together and we'll read it through um, and see if we can figure out what they're looking for. Um, this fee to apply thing? That's not cool. <laughs> Uh, $26 just to apply? That that seems really unfair to the artist. We will never charge anything as far as the City of Clearwater putting a call up there for you to apply to. In other words, being married? Um, well, no. Some of these programs, they um, have administrative fees or they will allow more, um, more photos to be listed. We have to pay as a listing agency per photo that comes in. So if they allow for more photos to be submitted by the artist, that increases their cost. Uh, it costs us about $1,000 to list a call on CAFE as far as the administration agency. We build that into our project cost. Uh, a lot of these they charge because they're shows. Mm -hmm. So it's only like for a month or two Yeah, and some, some regular commissioning agencies will charge too. It doesn't mean that they're not worth applying to, but you know your pocketbook. I mean, if it doesn't make sense to pay $100 to apply to something, you know, just, you know, don't, don't go for it. Um, let me find one, see if there's any in Florida. I know there's a lot of call through artists out there right now. I sent one over to, uh, to I sent a list over to Jerry recently. And yeah, that list is on one of the other tabs. We went through each one. Okay, cool. One tap over the M. The M? This one? Alright, there we go. Our friends down in Broward. 
Broward's got one of the longest running public art programs in the state. And it kind of goes back and forth between Broward and uh, here, Broward and uh, Miami-Dade County. Now here's an awesome one, it's a pre-qualified roster. <coughs> pre-qualified rosters are like those databases where you submit to the agency ahead of time when there's not a commission and they keep you on file so that if a uh, mosaic commission comes up, they respond and go through all the mosaic submittals that they received and pick somebody out of there or pick three people out of there to come back and say, this is what we would do to this facility. So it's the easiest way. It's like leaving your resume and it's always on top of somebody's desk that they have access to. How, how do you get to be on a pre-qualified roster? Um, here's, let's, let's read this together here. Um, so this one's specifically for Broward County. Artist eligibility. Mid-career professional artists who have resided in Broward County for a minimum of two years. There's their, there's their residency requirement. And who have a strong interest in gaining expertise in the public art process are encouraged to apply. Artists working in all media are eligible. No prior public art experience is required. That's awesome. Because what they do is set you up with a mentor in public art work. They're going to be your go-to person to say, how did you do it? How did you start? They'll train you in the medium. They'll train you in the documentation that you have to have for a project. And oftentimes, if they have a commission, you will work with them on that commission and gain the experience with that. You can list that in your resume. And programs that, say for example, you've gone through Broward, other programs in the state will say, OK, if this artist knows what they're doing. They know what they're talking about. So. This is for pre-qualified artists for $50,000 or more through the public art system. Um, in order to gain technical and administrative expertise needed to complete, compete within the field of public art. Ar allied artists are matched up with commissioned artists based on their level of experience, medium, and general interests. The lady that manages this one is named Christina Roldan. And she uh, spends probably about 50 to 60% of her time working with this, checking on the mentors, reviewing applications and placing them together. It's a match system. It's not just randomly assigned. They want to make sure that the artist fits together to gain the most experience possible. So it's a shame you have to be living in Broward County, but these are the kind of things you want to be looking for that apply to you. Is there anything like that on the sidewalk? Hillsborough County Arts Council will do things like that, and they often, um, last year they had a artist resource grant that you can apply for, I think it was up to $3,000 to expand your craft as an artist. And that can be anything from supplies, technology, going to a conference, or getting training in the arts. You can use that for tuition reimbursement. And I was a panelist on their, their grant review panel, and we awarded the most points to artists that had a specific need that was clarified that improved their skills as an artist. There was a lot of, I need a new Macintosh laptop because that'd be great. Um, yeah, I'd love a new one too, but how does that advance you as an artist aside from letting you browse the web better? Now, if they said, I needed this one program on the computer, that would be better because then they could then operate in a program. The artists that got high marks were going to a conference specific to their medium. They were taking a training class at USF or you know, another college to diversify their skill set. Um, they were buying materials specific to their medium. Uh, one artist was doing an archive project for old photography, and they were buying a high-end scanner. That part of the portion of their allotment went towards the purchase of that. You know, it, the those kind of things are really show up well as far as the artist defining their medium and their craft. So. Um, it's a shame that the Pinellas County Arts Council doesn't exist anymore. Um, however, the Hillsborough County Arts Council has really reached across the bay, if you will, to assist Pinellas County artists. I strongly recommend that you take a look through their website. Um, take a look at the opportunities that they're having right now and see what kind of advancement they're doing. Also, the um, local art studios and the local art education facilities, the Neaton Fine Arts Center, the Creative Artists uh, Workshop. Um, I remember, there's one just off of um, Douglas near the brewery um, in Dunedin. That's a good one. Um, look for 
places that have classes that can train you or studio space that you can work in and around other artists. Okay, so maybe you're an artist that likes to work alone by yourself, but go to time, uh, go to open gallery talks and interface with other artists and find out what they're doing. Ask them questions of, you know, how are you competing or how are you applying to other color artists? Like the gallery here, the gallery talk that you're at tonight. It's good that you're here. Jerry and Scott have done an amazing job in elevating Clearwater's uh, community arts resources. And actually, I wanted to give them a little thank you. Um, because a lot of times, the art administrator for the city can only do so much. Uh, in addition to public artwork, I do cultural affairs, which is hanging exhibits and buildings. I do the international relations program, which was at, was at earlier tonight, which is um, Sister City's relationship and things like that. And I also review every special event permit that comes through the city. There are over 150 programs every year that we do, and I have to communicate with like more than 12 departments on each of those. So public art went from like all of my time down to about this much of my time. But that's my passion, and this is the stuff that I work on when I have a break to work on what I want to do. Um, so let's keep going through this. Sorry, I'm kind of spinning off the wheels tonight. Um, here's their selection process. Their artists are asked to submit a letter of interest, a professional resume, and one CD, I'm still using CDs, um, with digital images of recent work uh, and an annotated image list. Make sure those two work on Macs and PCs. A lot of times we'll get dead disks or back in the day that it was in only one format. We had to take them out um, unless it was prior to the deadline and we'd call them up and say, hey, reformat your disk, send it pronto. Um, and make sure your annotated image list matches up with what's on the CD because there's nothing worse than trying to figure out um, dimensions of a piece that's not the correct piece. Uh, also, if you like using inches um, or centimeters or any other metric um, measurements, put them into feet <laughs> as well. Most of the time I do um, for outdoor pieces, I'm always converting them into feet because the selection panel says, Okay, 47 and a half inches. How many feet is that? You know, and so I'll have to either do it ahead of time or I'm caught on the fly trying to convert that for them. Um, letter of interest and professional resume. The letter of interest is where your research shines as far as I want to work for you. Um, for example, if they put out that this is the uh, so and so's memorial swimming complex or something like that. Figure out who that is and what impact they had on the community. If you work in bronze, do you want to go traditional bronze or do you want to go contemporary? If you work in another medium, do they seem like they'd accept something a little more um, non-representational? Uh, maybe captivating an idea of this person? Or do they want to see your traditional kind of, here's a memorial to this person, plaque? You know, it, it depends on what they're looking for. Um, so further on, this says the committee will review the visual and written materials submitted in order to develop a roster of artists may considered for future awards. You're, you're going to probably, if they're a good program, hear back that they A, received your document, B, have put it into their uh, database, and thank you very much. You may not hear anything from them for a very long time, or perhaps if they just never get your artwork into um, a commission that wants to use that, you may never hear from them. But if you have that letter that says they've received it, trust that they have it in their program and the right opportunity just hasn't come up yet. Uh, when a major public artist project is commissioned, the commissioned artist will review the pre-qualified artist roster for a shortlist, interview, and select an allied artist for the project. So that's in this particular one where they draw those potentials from to give to the artist. That's who that person is going to look through and say, I want to work with him or her, and, and pull it out, and then they go from there. For pre-qualified lists for commissioned artwork outside of this Allied Artist Program, they say, we're looking, for, uh, we're looking for mosaicists, we're looking for muralists, we're looking for photographers. They pull five, maybe, and they'll, say, they'll write you and say, congratulations, you've been selected from our pre-qualified roster for this project. They'll send you all the details on the project. Then they may say, 
in one month's time, we would like you to come to us and give us a site-specific presentation as to what you would do for this facility. Ask them as many questions as you can in that time frame that you need to tailor your presentation to that facility. Um, height, light conditions, activity at the space, who's working in that space, and try and find your best fit for that facility. When you go there, really knock your socks off and say, hey, I've done your research. I found out that you're a genetics and cancer research that specifically targets right-turning DNA. Um, it sounds really weird, but I had a project in UF that it was a genetics and cancer research that specified in DNA. They were on the cusp of DNA research. The artist submitted a right-turning DNA, usually DNA turns out, um, and the scientists were like, it doesn't turn that way. A month later, they came back and they said, somebody's in the lab looking at right-turning DNA. We want that artist. So it's a matter of knowing your medium and knowing the space. And that artist got that commission just, just for doing that homework. So um, I, I, in a nutshell, that's the crazy world of applying to art. Um, like I said, I'm leaving my card with all of you. Please take me up on the offer. I will look through your resume, tell you what to keep in there. I'll ask you a question if, if there's an area that looks to be lacking. Do you have background in this? Or can you rearrange some of this in a way that is most effective for you? Um, it may take me a little bit to get back to you, but I will do the same. Thank you. I have received your application. I hope to get it back to you by this time. If, you, if I haven't, give me an email and remind me, but you'll get something. Okay. Um, are there any questions before I go? A lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, beyond the resume stuff, call me up. I'll try and get back to you. Best way to reach me is by phone. I try and get people back within 24 hours to the next day. Um, email, I get a gazillion emails. So it may get lost in the shuffle. I do have a municipal spam-based filter, too, that captures stuff from city employees <coughs> sometimes. I don't even know why it does that. But call me up. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you for having the interest in developing your skills as an artist and participating in the arts community. Pinellas has some wonderful artists. We just need to get them further elevated. So thank you. Thank you.